morning, dear participants of the 5th SEC Lexington Preparatory Youth Board competition. Uh, my name is Aksana Delova. I'm going to be the chair of this arbitration panel today. And my co arbitrators will now briefly introduce themselves. Please. My name is Anna Shinkova. I'm the split resolution partner on the deputation panel of uh, Russian Northern Club. My name is Alexander Stepanenko, I am a legal assistant of Bill Gertz, our Minsk office. So, good luck to you all. <laughs> and now I will ask the participants to introduce themselves and the parties they represent today. Okay. Uh, my name is Alexander Sekarokina, I am from High School Economics, and we present today the panel. And my colleague. My name is Dr. Dinoz, I also represent Higher School Economics and uh, I'm on the payment side. Let me be on the next side. My name is Maxim Chopinski and I am the respondent's part of uh, I'm. Uh, my name is uh, Dmitry Akon and uh, I will represent the uh, party of the panel. Could you please repeat your name once again? Uh, Before we start, uh, may I ask the participants whether you have reached the agreement on the proceedings and the location of time for the proceedings? Yes, we have. Uh, we decided that, uh, first of all, we will uh, elaborate on the procedural part. Uh, since uh, the defendant has uh, contra claims to the plaintiff, uh, we would let them start uh, for 15 minutes, then uh, we will elaborate on our position, and then we would ask you for a five minute rebuttal. Then we will uh, deliver on the substantive part. Uh, here we would like to start uh, also for 15 minutes for each person, and then for a five minute rebuttal. If I'm not mistaken, you put into the rules, uh, there is a maximum two minutes for for uh, Okay. Then four minutes total, and two for each. Okay. Okay. Then you will proceed with the procedural part. Alright. Respected members of the original tribunal, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Maxim Chaplinsky, and that is Nick Kwon, and we are the respondents consuls. In this case, we have a classic triangle uh, in which uh, have a classic triangle in which uh, the buyer, the seller, and the bank are the sides of this triangle. In the base of this triangle, there are the seller and the buyer, the seller uh, and the buyer ended in the ship building contract. Uh, and at the top of this triangle, there is the bank. The, bu the buyer uh, ordered the bank to effect the payment. Uh, to the seller, and we will show you that it doesn't mean that the bank became a part of the contract. We will prove that the letter of credit uh, as an independent document. Uh, we will prove that the letter of credit is an independent document, and we will try to convince you, respective members of the virtual tribunal, uh, that the plaintiff's claims are supported. Uh, supported uh, and grounded neither by the uh, facts nor by the law. Uh, our position in this case is based on the following documents. First of all, International Court of Arbitration of the ICC Rules of the Arbitration 2012. Uh, second, the Use Trial Model Law of International Commercial Arbitration. Uh, third, uh, UCP number 600, and last, the Madrid principles. Uh, the respondents respectfully ask the virtual tribunal uh, to accept its lack of jurisdiction over the present dispute according to the reason uh, the right of credit as an autonomous contract and the respondent isn't bound by any obligations uh, under the shipbuilding contract. Also, the respondent states uh, that the second arbitration are based on the same, on the same 
uh, constructional uh, relationships, uh, and uh, that is why it's necessary to suspend uh, present arbitration proceeding. Uh, the decision can minimize risk, risks uh, of uh, conflicting results and unnecessary wasting of time and costs. Uh, furthermore, the respondent states uh, that the arbitral tribunal isn't, isn't entitled uh, to decide the issue of validity uh, of the uh, <coughs> acceptance act. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, the respondent stated that uh, the letter of credit is an autonom autonomous contract. The respondent isn't bound by any arbitration clause uh, which contains in a separate document. These two contracts, the letter of credit and the shipbuilding contract, are independent to each other. And according to the Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the USP 600, a credit by its nature is a separate transaction from the sale or other contract on which it may be based. Uh, this, that, that is why the extension of the uh, <coughs> arbitration contract uh, to the parties of this arbitration uh, will be the violation of the main principle of the letter of credit. And this is a guess for interrupting you. As far as note, the respondent issued letter of credit. So you yeah. issued and please uh, now bring your attention to letter of credit, uh, paragraph 10. And it's clearly said that this letter of credit shall full of facts with regard to the terms of this letter of credit. So the, uh, the contract Shipbuilding contract will uh, will shall have a full fact with regard to terms of letter of credit. How can you uh, just your comments on it? Thank you for the question. Um, according to the Article Four of the USP six hundred, uh, banks in an odd way concerned with a bound by such contract even if any reference whatsoever uh, to it is included in the credit. That is why uh, I say that uh, the point, uh, Article 10 of the letter of credit uh, doesn't mean that uh, we, as a respondents, are bound by the arbitration clause uh, which contain, uh, which includes in shipbuilding contract. Okay, but um, you issue uh, this letter of credit and you you bound you bound with it and you bring the full responsibility of what, what is written here and you stated there will shall have a full effect. If you wanted to uh, just extend to a material part of the contract, uh, not uh, not with regards to arbitration clause, you you can put it like uh, which how. Uh, Will have a full effect or have uh, a effect except the arbitration clause. But why did you, did you do that and just now object it? Object the arbitration clause. Thank you, I understand. Uh, Article 10 means uh, that this letter of credit uh, was opened uh, to affect the payment uh, according to the shipbuilding contract. It doesn't mean that uh, we incorporate. Uh, arbitral clause uh, or some other parts of the shipbuilding contract. Uh, we just paid money uh, for uh, yacht construction, constructors. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll continue. Yeah. Uh, we'll save you. Uh, uh, the violation of the main principle of the letter of credit, autonomy principle. Uh, second, uh, the claimant argues that the respondent is bound by the arbitration clause contained in the shipbuilding contract according to the Article 10 of the Letter of Credit. Uh, Article 4, paragraph uh, 8 of the uh, USP 600 states that the credit by its nature is a separate transaction from the sale 
or other contract on which it may be based. Banks are not way, uh, are in no way concerned with or bound uh, by such contracts. Contracts, even if any reference whatsoever to it is included in the credit. I just say it. Uh, this leads to the conclusion that provisions of uh, Article 10 of the letter of credit cannot refer uh, to the extension or official uh, <coughs> contract uh, that con contains in a shipbuilding contract uh, to the party of the letter of credit. And Article 10 of the letter of credit shows a general in the fence reference that doesn't show any intent of the parties to include uh, a mutual clause in the letter of credit. Uh, the second point uh, that the respondent isn't bound by any obligations under the shipbuilding contract. Uh, as you can see on the page 15 of the case materials, uh, Article 2.3.1 Paragraph B uh, uh, of the shipbuilding contract uh, calls the respondent as an issuing bank of the letter of credit. It doesn't matter that the bank is entrusted with obligations under the shipbuilding contract. Uh, in the relations uh, with the parties over shipbuilding contract, the bank is an independent guarantor which exercises the LC, letter of credit, under determined conditions. Uh, for those reasons, uh, it's clear that the respondent uh, doesn't have any obligation and the shipbuilding contract. The third point that the suspension of the present proceeding is necessary uh, because both arbitration proceedings are based on the same contractual relationships. Uh, respondent, the respondent states uh, that the present arbitration um, proceeding are their, and their second arbitration uh, are based on the same contractual relationship. Uh, when I say uh, about the second arbitration, I mean the um, ICC case number 1998. Um, this, uh, the main question of the second arbitration uh, is a question about the validity of the acceptance act. And that means that this case is very important uh, to make an informed decision uh, at the present case. So, but the second arbitration is based purely on the relations between the buyer and the seller. So, how is it connected with this case? Uh, thanks for the question. I understand. Um, I can say that uh, one of the um, most important points of the second arbitration is the uh, uh, validity of the acceptance act. Uh, because um, the acceptance act uh, and the acceptance act is uh, very important for second arbitration because. Uh, the validity or, or the validity of our acceptance act uh, can lead uh, to payment, uh, payment or not payment to the uh, buyer compensate uh, uh, of uh, defects for defects of the yacht, the eighteen millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You have three minutes left, so please make sure to conclude your argument. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the suspension of the present proceeding uh, can minimize risks uh, of conflicting results and uh, unnecessary waste of time and costs. It's not a secret that the arbitration uh, is an expensive procedure and uh, it requires much time, so uh, there is no need to waste your uh, time uh, to the hearing of the dispute, uh, which uh, may be successfully resolved in a second arbitration. And on this basis, uh, as respondent 
ask the tribunal uh, to suspend this present proceeding and my last argument uh, the respondent also states that the arbitration tribunal uh, isn't entitled to decide in this arbitration the issue of validity of the acceptance act uh, the respondent states that there is a second arbitration where the issue of validity of the acceptance act is the subject of a dispute and to examine the question of validity of the acceptance act, uh, acceptance act uh, means to interfere uh, in the other arbitration procedure. It may cause uh, the conflict of uh, competence of the two arbitral tribunals. And moreover, uh, uh, this uh, interfere may be used by the parties uh, in order to try to uh, invalid, invalid, <coughs> validate uh, the final arbitral award in national court. Uh, for those reasons, the respondent asks the arbitral tribunal uh, to accept its lack of jurisdiction over the present dispute and wait for the decision of the second arbitration uh, and then uh, to resolve this case in whole. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Anastasia Kropka and I would like to present to you uh, the position of payment. And I would like to divide my speech into um, uh, three parts. First is um, one notice that I want to make for the panel of perpetrators and then to organize and I want to present you. So, <clears throat> our first argument is that uh, the current proceedings shouldn't be suspended by the arbitra uh, arbitral panel um, because there was not and there is not a final reward in the case number 1998. Uh, the, uh, the second argument is that uh, the arbitration clause incorporated in the Shibira contract is extended to the respondent as to the um, claimant. Uh, first of all, I want to start with a notice uh, that uh, to us <coughs> uh, seems very important uh, in this precedent. Uh, <coughs> and due to the fact uh, that um, uh, the respondent has failed to file its um, answer to the request for arbitration in time, uh, we ask the, arbit the arbitration uh, panel not to consider the um, uh, answer <coughs> to, to the request for arbitration. I will clarify my position. So, uh, due to the <coughs> paragraph 5, Article 4 of the ICC rules, uh, the Secretariat of the uh, ICC shall um, transmit the request uh, of filed by the claimant at the same uh, date as um, <coughs> uh, it has received it. So, uh, we are aware that uh, the uh, request for arbitration was uh, transmitted to the respondent on the date when we uh, submitted our request. So, you can see, <coughs> and uh, okay, uh, I will um, clarify the legal points and then I will go to the facts. And so, uh, due to paragraph 1 of Article 5 of the ICC rules, uh, the respondent shall submit its um, answer to the request for arbitration within 30 days um, from the receipt of the request. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, you can see on the page 2 of the case materials, that the claimant um, submit the request on the 1st of May 2016. Counselor, I will interrupt you. How is this relevant to the jurisdictional issue? I will uh, clarify okay. in some minutes. Okay, and so, uh, nevertheless, the respondent submits its answer on the 1st of uh, six, uh, oh, on the 1st of uh, June 2016. So, it was done uh, within 31 days. So, we understand that uh, it is um, <coughs> The um, 
a limited uh, limitation of our rights because, uh, for example, <coughs> Article 5 of the ICC rules stipulate that uh, the Secretariat has a right to uh, grant an extension, but there is no evidence in the case material that this extension was granted. So, as we understand, uh, if, uh, for example, this um, uh, answer for request will not be considered by the panel of arbitrators, it means that there is no a request of a respondent to suspend this uh, arbitration proceedings. Uh, so, <clears throat> we understand if, uh, we, if we continue, if the arbitration panel uh, decides to continue this arbitration proceedings, uh, we ask you to not to consider the answer from the respondent. That answer for uh, request that was filed by the uh, It's our um, <coughs> request, but now I want to go to two arguments that also we base our on, also on which we also base our um, uh, position. First of all, <coughs> the current proceedings also shouldn't be suspended uh, due to the second argument uh, that in the first case. Uh, number 1998 um, hasn't been rendered by the report. So, <coughs> uh, we want to pay attention to the fact that uh, in the International Law Association recommendation there is a requirement in Article 6 that um, um, to <coughs> suspend the uh, parallel proceeding that the respondent has uh, stipulated. It is uh, necessary to, uh, to meet the <coughs> three conditions. So, that uh, there, um, there are the same parties, there is the same object, and uh, that <coughs> uh, the um, claim was submitted uh, with, um, with no prejudice in the same capacity by the uh, parties. And so, uh, we want to state that uh, there are um <coughs> not uh, the same parties. The parties to our proceeding is a respondent and who is a bank and uh, the claimant, so we are from uh, Lucia. And uh, in a parallel proceeding there are two different parties. Uh, it's buyer uh, who is a manifesto and uh, the um, seller who is, uh, who is we are. So uh, the first requirement is not met. And the second requirement that there is the same subject also wasn't met. Uh, it is um, <coughs> proved by the fact that here uh, we uh, refer to the uh, subject of matter that um, um, the bank didn't pay and didn't pay to us the 15% of money that we uh, already agreed in the contract. And in the parallel proceeding there is another matter, there is the request of damages. It is also approved by the case materials. <coughs> also, um, it was um, this um, requirement uh, in um, best practice of international trade law also named as the dependence, and so we uh, want to say that this principle is not uh, applicable in our case. The second um, principle that is very important also in best practice of uh, international trade law is uh, the principle of res judicata. And also, uh, we want to state that this principle is also not applicable in our case. Uh, because there is no final award in the um, uh, case number 1998. Uh, now we are aware that there is um, a proceeding that was studied uh, before our proceeding. But we are not aware of the fact when it will be finished. And if there will be a award, or maybe it will be suspended, maybe it will be cancelled. So now we are not um, aware of the final award and we are not sure about the fact that it will, will be done. Also, for example, <coughs> uh, we are not sure that uh, due to this fact, it will have now there is no prejudice of this case. On, uh, that is the most important requirement for application, for example, of this principle of right judicata. And, uh, <coughs> uh, okay. Now I want to go to my second argument, uh, that the arbitration clause incorporated in a shipbuilding contract is extended also to respond. First of all, I want to mention that uh, the position of um, 
respondent seems as very strange because uh, we didn't mention in our claim that we base our arguments on the Article 10. We base our argument on the other um, <coughs> um, conditions and on the other requirements. Now we present you this. <coughs> First of all, I want to pay the attention of the arbitrators uh, to the fact uh, that the um, <coughs> validity and interpretation of the shipbuilding contract is um, regulated by the, IC, uh, by the Lex Mercatorium and also, due to this fact, it is regulated by the UNDRA Principle 2010. The preamble of Fund Draft Principles 2010 contains a provision according to which also it is proving our um, it is proving the governing law, uh, that the principles apply when the parties agree to adjust the contract uh, to general principle of law. So we want to say that um, the contract is also regulated by the law principles. Um, in <coughs> It is proved, we can prove it, it is proved by the uh, clause 2.1.1, you can see it on the page 19. Uh, there is a fact that uh, the shipbuilding contract is coming by the best principles of international trade law. So, uh, according to uh, Article 11.1.2 of the UNIDRA principles, the respondent and the applicant are um, joint debtors for the payment of the monetary obligation. And uh, the applicant, as we know, uh, has committed a fraud against the beneficiary, so against us, uh, because in this case, we have, um, the lips, <coughs> yeah, is a beneficiary. And, um, this word was fulfilled by the fact that uh, the applicant added um, additional condition uh, that is um, <coughs> uh, national certificate of uh, uh, national certificate of safety. Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> and so we we said that by this fact the applicant has violated the requirement. So we know that. Uh, there is no this condition in the shipbuilding contract. But we know that this condition is incorporated in the letter of credit. So by adding this condition, the applicant um, has violated the requirements for um, fair dealing and so uh, is <coughs> dealing in business to know without good faith. Um, <coughs> also, we want to state that uh, the respondent uh, has seen the shipbuilding contract because due to the Article 10, it said that, that the contract has the full effect for the letter of credit. It is uh, in common sense that the respondent has seen, has seen uh, the shipbuilding contract and understand the provision. So by uh, agreeing, by making an agreement that the condition about national ship safety uh, certificate uh, including this certificate in um, letter of credit, also a respondent uh, making <coughs> uh, was dealing with the bad faith. Uh, now we want to um, uh, pay the panel of arbitration to the Article 3.2.8 of the Draft Principles. This article says, now I would like to review an article, it's a little, uh, it's a limit, and so then I will um, inter interpret it. Where fraud, threat, gross disparity of or a party mistakes is imputable uh, to or is known uh, or ought to be known by a third person for whose act the other party is responsible, the contract may be avoided under the same conditions as if the behavior or knowledge has been <coughs> that of the party. So in this case we see that if uh, in our contract uh, there are two parties, buyer and seller, and we are aware about the third party respondent. So if <coughs> uh, the respondent is aware uh, about the fraud, threat, gross disparity or a party mistake that was made by the uh, seller, so by the, um, by the buyer, so by the manifesto, uh, under this clause, 
3.2.8 of the UNRWA principles. And the behavior of the respondent um, is recognized as a behavior of the 